I don't know if I can see if I can add a pog champ screen. It's gonna be in the small left hand corner of the screen. Beautiful. Actually, he's gonna replace. You see that calendar in the back there? That's what that's what's gonna be on the calendar. Boom. The pog champ calendar. Pog calendar. <laughs> She's not necessarily a, or at least she doesn't consider herself a philosopher, but um, she is a one of the leading experts in kind of the gender studies and the development of gender argument based arguments. Uh, she's also done some work on uh, things like Israel, the Israel Palestine issue, and she wrote this book. The book we're talking about which is called um the force of Nonviolence. uh i've only read about three chapters because of my philosophy class only required three chapters but we're only going over the first one let me kind of give the basic rundown of the things that we're going to be going over today so first we're going to want to talk about um or deconstruction of individualism uh, and then maybe we will get forward enough into equal grievability which is kind of a difficult concept to get into so what is it what exactly is she talking about by she I mean Judith Butler uh, what is Judith talking about when she says a deconstruction of individualism? What? So, she doesn't mean, like, break down that you are, that you are a person. So, it's not to say that, like, if you feel pain that you are that pain is not like your own obviously that pain is your own or if you were to feel an emotion that emotion is your own that experience is your own when you experience things it's not to say that you are not your own person so what she's talking about is actually individualism in a hobbesian so that you are against all and all are against you and that the government or any sort of intermediary any sort of societal intermediary is there to quell that jealous rage that would want you to go and steal something attack someone just to placate you basically make sure that things are generally equal so rather than have this idea of individualism, so what Butler says here is that it's not that this individualism is necessarily wrong. You're, it's not to, to say that it's like completely wrong. Again, she still believes that you are your own being, that you can experience things. It's that it introduces a unrealistic fantasy. And um, this is a, she's using a specific type of fantasy, which is with a PH, PH fantasy. So this fantasy would be something that is a daydream, a daydream of an aspiration. It can be held by one person or by many, but it is a, a daydream that is almost unconscious if you will or it, it it is unconscious to the point like it's it's societally ingrained into you and she says that this is kind of limiting this fantasy the fantasy that you are your solely your own being and she actually borrows from Karl Marx the little inspi inspiration um, when she talks about that it would be kind of 
weird to say that everyone, every kind of man is just on an island by himself. And that there is no, no economic, no social, no connection at all. It, that every, every man is just placed upon an island to which he provides for himself and, and is the sole caretaker. It's wrong in the sense that it doesn't even start at the right point. Because this individualist fantasy starts at a, a point of adulthood which you can take care of yourself and she says that that's not it's not good to remove the aspect that you are you were once dependent you were dependent in the first place you were a child who could not provide for themselves who had to be provided for and so to have that idea of self-sufficiency, to be able to take care of yourself is wrong from the foundation. Foundationally, you are not a independent being. You are completely dependent as a, as a being as a starting being. That's the concrete. But uh, she talks about also how this fantasy, this individualistic fantasy, brings about our idea of gender roles. That since the fantasy is constructed, this individualistic fantasy is constructed on the basis that the most self-sufficient being or the standard self-sufficient being is a a man is a man you have masculine and feminine independence being placed under a masculine context and interdependence or dependency being placed on a feminine context so that's that's her argument on how both the male the individual fan individualistic fantasy both affects us in our view of our perception of reality how it influences our perception of reality as well as influencing our our standings and ties with the opposite sex <laughs> For Ryan, Ryan, for your comment that uh, one is not constantly affected by and affecting others, um, I, I think Butler would agree with that. Um, I think what she would say, though, is be careful you don't move too close to consequentialism. Because it's not that you are interconnected with others because of the actions to which you do it's you are interconnected with others because you are human well she's not saying because when she borrowed from marx obviously you know that's a little bit of an extreme example you know that's the ph fantasy the fantasy that you are self-reliant She's ma more so making a critique of that ideal um, than they are uh, than she is attacking the spectrum of individuality. So, so one might say I am more or less independent or dependent. But Butler would, would respond and retort that you are a completely dependent being. You go through a process to which you are individuated. Individuation is what she calls the process. 
um, but you will never truly be foundationally an independent being. You are at your foundation, at your core. You are a dependent being. And she, the way that she kind of describes this is that you are dependent on the social structures to which are given to you. So you, she brings up walking. And in her case, she goes to like a physical therapist. She's a little older. Uh, she goes to a physical therapist and she says, I am completely dependent upon my ability to walk both on the efforts of my physical therapist and on the efforts to which the pavement has provided to be placed beneath my feet. So she's looking at this at a grandiose scale beyond oneself. That if she was not provided with these services, if she was not provided with these institutions, she would not be able to constitute herself as a being. I, I kind of like that argument, yeah. Like we could not we could not sustain ourselves upon our own like yeah. We couldn't build radio towers on our own. We couldn't uh build roads on our own. Yeah, it's it's a less um I would say Judith is much less a political theorist. Uh, obviously, it does have some political ties, as all kind of philosophy does. But I would say she is more of a... A theorist to which you can place a cultural ideal in. Because she does mention throughout the times, uh, throughout a lot of the times in the book, that her idea of this n commitment to nonviolence is idealistic. It's it may be too fruitful to think of, but she she balances that and says. Well, even if it is too fruitful to think of, you you have these realists who would say, oh, you know, I, sure, I would love to live in a world without violence, but that's not, that's never going to be possible. And so she says, well, even to that, to have that idea, have that thought is somewhat... Although these are radical ideas, it somewhat moves that moves that bar, if you will, Mo pushes it up. Um, but I was going to read a sentence here that kind of clarifies what I was going to say. So she has on page 49, I know you guys don't have the book, but I'll say the page numbers anyways. My counter thesis to state the, of nature hypothesis is that no body can sustain itself on its own. The body is not, and never was, a self-subsisting kind of being, which is but one reason why the metaphysics of substance, which conceives the body as an extended being with discrete boundaries, was never particularly good frame for understanding what a body is. Let's talk about equal grievability then. So this is the most complicated uh, thing in Butler's piece. I don't even think I fully understand it quite yet. Um, it's hard to... It almost requires you to not be thinking as an individual almost. It requires you to really step out of yourself. Um, so what equal grievability is, is basically referring to the systems to which we live in, recognizing every human life as a loss. And so kind of how 
So what what confused me about this concept was how does this actualize? And at first I was thinking like, okay, I, I was thinking in an individualist sense where I was like, wait, is this meant to be like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to think of each person that has died as like my family. As like, you know, this person, oh, it's my family. I should grieve for them in the same way that I would grieve for a family member. That's not the case. So in an interview in the New Yorker, she talked about it and she said that really what inspired her for this equal grievability is the difference between how people grieved for those who were lost, like the nameless people who were lost in the 9-11 attacks and the people who were lost like namelessly to or I'm not sure namelessly I don't know I don't know much about the AIDS crisis but the people who are lost to the AIDS crisis kind of that societal recognition that this person was a loss that they had died and their death was a loss to society as a whole so that is what equal grievability talks about and it's hard to actualize, which is why I'm not going to, like, talk about it as much as I talked about, like, the deconstruction of individualism. Let's see. So, Butler talks about frustration and anger. Um, because she does concede that, you know, even in a dependent society... Societal ties will bring about frustration and anger. There is no moving past that. And she even says that the idea of nonviolence coming from this, this aura almost, this, this part of your soul, which is inherently without aggression, without anger, has no aggressive emotion in it. She says that that's not really, like, that's not the case, at least. That, like, this ritualistic idea that you can move to a place of inner peace and calm and never experience these angry and strong emotions, that's not a real place or it's not a place that's like plausible at least um and she also attacks against the idea of like the Hobbesian again she brings up Hobbes and she says you know to have like the go government intermediate all these things to prevent you from realizing your rage that's not really the case either because, again, that moves towards an independent mindset. Instead, what she talks about is aggression that is moved within itself. This is a really big key of Butler's argument about nonviolence, is that nonviolence is not some, like, inherent like act of mode of being it is a sustained commitment to which you are fulfilling you will constantly reaffirm this commitment of nonviolence, and that that commitment to nonviolence allows that aggression to move within itself and slowly kind of beat itself down in a almost aggressive form of nonviolence. So you are aggressively or militantly, as she puts it, because she references uh, Albert Einstein's militant pacifism, but you're militantly being nonviolent. Asian. Oh, this is important. Um, so she talks about how she actually... Um, I'm not sure if this is framed as a retort to to Marx. Um, I don't I don't believe it is. She only mentions Marx once, 
Um, but she kind of breaks away from saying like, oh, this dependency, this interdependency that like I've been talking about, the ultimate goal of this interdependency is not a freedom of subjugation of like you know this kind of authoritarian rule it is not a a freedom of that kind like you that is not the ultimate goal or if you look at it from like a marxist perspective it's not like it's so the proletariat is to ultimately break from subjugation of the bourgeoisie in in this case Butler is saying that's not the case here. You're not breaking free from some some ultimate system to be unshackled in a way. You are accepting that you are a dependent being. That is the ultimate goal of this mindset. That you are accepting that you are completely dependent upon which you the society you live in. Um Oh, this one's... Okay. So, uh, here is where Butler denies the right to self-defense. You know, murder being immoral. This immoral action. But they make a exception for self-defense. And that's, uh, that's one of the problems, one of the many, I think there's about like three, three, four, maybe, that I found problems that Butler has, at least in this first description of the first chapter of self-defense. Um, that it is completely, it is a complete exception of the rule of that murder is wrong. The second point that she she makes is that it's ambiguous what is the self how can you define the self so are you defining the self as only your corporeal being or are you f defining the self as those to which you have relations to because if you're having okay well self-defense is you know We'll go with the first kind of self-defense where you'd say, okay, uh, sure, we'll make it reasonable. We'll say self-defense is only about your corporeal being. You know, you can only protect yourself. Well, in that case, someone's attacking your home. Someone's, someone's robbing your home. Someone comes in and tries to rob your home. And you try and defend yourself. But... They weren't really attacking you per se, they were just attacking your home. Or even a different example, you, your friend is being like robbed and you go over to help him. Well, that's not self-defense, you're just assaulting someone because you're not protecting yourself you are protecting a friend. But, you know, to to most humans, that would sound kind of dirty. You'd be like, oh, well, like, why wouldn't I be able to protect my friend? Why wouldn't I be able to do that? Like, to, to go out and help him. So, then you say, okay, well, why don't we have self-defense be about social ties you know you you can protect those to which you have social ties to okay so now you can protect your friend you can protect your home you can protect your family and these are all considered part of yourself but if that is the case the person robbing your home the person that mugging your friend they are participants in your community. So, but they are not considered a part of the self. 
So those who commit crimes are innately not a part of the self, not a part of those. And, and you're seeing where this is kind of falling into is that you have us versus them. And in order to have that, Butler says, you are valuing the life of, the life of that person differently. You are saying, okay, well, since this person who's mugging my friend, who's robbing my home, who's accosting my family, since they are doing such things, they are not a part of myself. They are not a part of the self. So thus I can take action against them. I can fight against them. I can murder them. Because they are not a part of the self. They are deemed lesser. That is one kind of... Uh, that is the big, big problem that uh, Butler has with self-defense. Um, she actually ties this into kind of race problems. Um, and she talks about like how how it's baffling to see police officers who could be kneeling on someone's neck uh, and having that person say that they can't breathe to shoot someone who's running away who, to shoot someone who's lying on the couch to, to end these people's lives and the jury to acquit those people and she says although yes it is in the case where you it may not be like an all-white jury, so it's not like a necessarily... It doesn't have to be a race thing where an all-white jury is acquitting a, a, a cop. It could be that a, all, a black jury is doing so, but that is because of the societal recognition to which... Okay... This, it's not that this person, that this, this person who was running away, who was lying on the couch, who was, you know, telling the officer they couldn't breathe. It's not that they were doing a moral wrong in that immediate sense, but they see in that there is a potential sense of that person doing wrong in the future. And that is what causes them, influences them to be able to say, this was reasonable. They are not a part of the self. They are, they, they may have not been committing actions against this officer in particular, but they could have committed actions later on or could have committed actions before towards someone who was a part of the self. So already they are not a part of the self. And that was the kind of like argument that she made uh, on like race relations and, and things like that and police brutality. and others that shouldn't exist what should a person do if it is a life or death situation practically where the other person has decided that they are okay with violence and not valuing themselves for you so are you talking about like a point where like let's say someone uh I guess I'm confused about her argument about where her stance 
is and might just need a recap on the police thing. So, um, overall, basically, overall, she says that self-defense in the use of, like, murder and violence is wrong. And that's because nonviolence is the act to, or the commitment to nonviolence, even when violence is the strongest attempt. So she's kind of saying that, like, violence may be the strongest temptation in that scenario, but there is not a need for violence. This is almost, um, oh shoot, I can't remember which philosopher made the, uh, shoot, the Aristotle or is it Plato? One of them, one of them. Basically, they, they said that it is not like no one can force you to do something. You cannot be forced to do something. So. Even if your life was in danger, you were not forced to kill that person. You made the active choice to kill that person. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, like, let's say George Floyd had the ability to defend himself. He is morally obligated not to do so. Exactly. She, it, it, he would not be obligated to do so no one forces his hand to to defend himself no one forces the hand of the officer to defend themselves or in like in in what judith is saying to defend the community by removing someone who is not the self you are making the conscious choice of violence and almost Almost making an excuse as to saying that, you know, well, I was forced to. I couldn't. I There was no other option. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else because violence was the only option. But that is not the case. So that is her critique of uh, self-defense. And she says on a macro scale, this kind of self and not self view is what kind of allows for wars because you have people who are in one country and people who are in another country and by allowing the, okay, well, this, this person was not very like nice to, uh, you know, to do whatever, blah, blah, blah. They are, you can make the kind of, you don't even have to name an action that they could do. You could just say that these people are not a part of the self. Therefore, they are a danger to us and we should take care of them. That's her idea of the macro scale of self and not self view. The way that is, he is morally obligated to do so. Kind of, yeah. But even in the case where he has no option out. So, uh, we'll move away from, like, George Floyd so, like, we don't get caught up in the particulars of the scenario and start naming, like, oh, well, this could have been done, this could have been done. We'll keep it simple to a hypothetical. Someone asks you, okay, you can either take take your friend's life or you can take your own life and there is no like rummaging around in this scenario you can't say like okay well i'll instead of attacking my friend i'll attack the guy who told me to do it and there will all be free no in this case it's a strict scenario strict scenario cannot move beyond the hypothetical butler would make the argument that 
you are making the choice, or I guess this isn't Butler yet, this is uh, Plato or Aristotle. I'm not sure which one made that argument, but you are making the active choice to either act against your friend, and I'm not sure how Butler would talk about like violence against yourself. Um, I'm sure she would have a really good, well placated or well, uh, well worded answer uh, that I can't think of. But you either take action and violence upon your friend, or you either take action upon yourself. It is not. No one has forced your hand into doing something. You are the only, you know, proprietor of your actions, I guess. There's more, like, in-depth commentary about that uh, in the book, but not in Judith Butler's book, but in, uh, in Nicomachean Ethics. Yeah, I think that's it. Who wrote Nicomachi? I need to know the answer now. Okay, yeah. There's more in-depth stuff of uh, that Aristotle talks about in Nicomachean Ethics. He really goes in-depth onto what can influence one's actions and things like that. It's really interesting. Understand that one person is a perfect pacifist, so it's more about recognizing if you defend yourself, it is immoral rather than creating a society where it is deemed justifiable. I'm I'm not even sure if she would agree to that, but that that's really good thinking on your part. That's yeah. Making a society where defending yourself is immoral, but you you aren't justified in doing so. I'm not sure how that would actualize. I'm not sure if, you know, blah blah blah, but but that is a very good explanation that you gave. Hey everyone, Ovino here. I just wanted to pop in at the last moment and just say thank you for watching. I really enjoyed editing this together as well as just doing it in the first place during the stream. Uh, it was on my Twitch, Ovino00. If you want to go there or drop, you know, a comment on a discussion you'd like to see in the future, I'd love to hear your feedback. I really enjoyed this, so I don't mind doing some in the future. Thanks for watching again. Bye.